one of the ultimate paradoxes of Guantanamo is that the environmental laws apply. So if you were an iguana, you would have legal rights. And if I, as an American, kicked you as an iguana, 10 years in pr prison, $10,000 fine. But if you're a foreigner, non-American, and I do that, you have no rights at all. And you know, one of the arguments we made before the United States Supreme Court is that you, as a foreigner, would be better off as an animal because at least you'd have rights. And it would be much better for you to have equal rights with iguanas than what you got right now. Now that's madness, that's total madness, but that's what the American government wanted to do. My favorite story is about a kid called Mohammed El Garani. I have to go to New York in two weeks to accept for him the Yoko Ono Courage Award because Yoko Ono is giving it to him. He was a 14 year old child from Saudi, but his background is from, uh, is Chad, so he's black, so he couldn't go to secondary school because it's racist. And um, what happened was he went to Pakistan because he wanted to learn English and computers. And like so many people, he got turned over to the Americans for a bounty. They were paying $5,000 for each Muslim that was turned over, and that's a lot of money in Pakistan. It's sort of like a quarter of a million dollars here. So lots of people get turned over. So Muhammad is then interrogated by Americans using Yemeni-speaking translators. And the word zalat in Yemeni Arabic means money, but in Saudi Arabic it means salad or tomatoes. So they start interrogating this 14-year-old child saying, what zalat did you have when you went to Pakistan? He thinks they're talking about salad. So he says, I had no zalat when I went to Pakistan. They said, you have to have zalat, because they're talking about money. And he said, no, 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 I could get zalat anywhere I needed it in Pakistan. So they immediately leap to the obvious conclusion, if you're a very, very stupid CIA agent, which is that he's an Al-Qaeda financier, if he could get money anywhere he wanted. So they interrogate this child about where in Karachi could you get Zalat, and he starts ticking off vegetable stalls. And they write this down, and they accuse this child of being an Al-Qaeda financier. And it's all just total madness. And that's what happens when you do away with little things like trials and lawyers and all the rest of it. So he spent six years in Guantanamo based on that sort of nonsense. And the still of the 61 people left in Guantanamo, we re represent about eight of them, and those are not cleared. So these are now the worst of the worst of the worst people in the entire world, according to the Americans. And they're nobody. And one of them is a guy called Ahmed Rabani, who was a taxi driver who they mistook for a guy called... Um, Hassan Gul, and they've got him locked up based on that, and they tortured him for 540 days in secret prisons. There were a series of informants in Guantanamo and elsewhere who informed on everybody in Guantanamo and just made stuff up. Uh, and they were doing it for their own benefit because they have immense power. The government has immense power to offer you your freedom as opposed to lock you up forever. And as a consequence, you get total nonsense. But then imagine that you're the person who this, you know, has been said you were in Tora Bora trying to escape Afghanistan in October 2002. How do you prove, locked up in Guantanamo Bay without a lawyer, without any access to the outside world, how do you prove that you're not a member of Al-Qaeda? You can't possibly do it. So then you end up being locked up there forever. And we blame them for everything that's wrong in our society. Uh, so the same thing happens here, that they have decided that you're an evil terrorist who's the cause of all of our troubles. And they do that honestly, they're not making up, they, they don't think they're arresting or detaining an innocent person, it's just they're really not very good at it. And one of the reasons that we've developed all of these legal rights over many, many centuries is because we've recognized that the government's actually not very good at it. And even in the world of the open judicial process in America, at one t point in the charity I ran in New Orleans, we represented 171 people who were arrested on capital murder charges by the government. We were able to prove that they had the wrong person in 126 cases. That's 74% of all of these people. They had the wrong person. 
Now, that's a pretty devastating indictment of an open judicial process in America. Imagine you translate that to a closed process where you know these fantasists with the American intelligence think they know everything about everyone and they're just wrong, but there's no one there to challenge it. Then you're going to make even more mistakes. And if you look at the 779 prisoners in Guantanamo Bay who were said to be the worst of the worst terrorists in the world by Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, we have already proven that a little over 93% of those people were not the worst of the worst terrorists in the world. And of the 61 people left, they've already cleared 20 of them, so that leaves only 41 people. I can look you in the eye and tell you right now, the people I represent among those 41 are not guilty. Uh, none of them are of being anyone's serious terrorist. That means that they've got it wrong in roughly 95% of the cases in Guantanamo Bay, according to their own records, not according to mine. Now, that's horrifying, and that's why we need a judicial process, because they're dreadful at their job. Well, the way they find that the, the so-called terrorists is basically through informants or through their little computer programs. So there are two ways. We either have informants in the community who are fingering you as a bad person, and there are all sorts of motivation there, whether it's that we're paying them or whether that they just don't like people and they're fingering them or whatever. It's a very dangerously corrupt process. But the alternative way they do it is through what's called metadata, which is you know whatever data they have on you and your mobile phone and so forth. So, for example, you may have a mobile phone, and you may be like me. You know, I work representing a bunch of people who are called terrorists. So I tweet words about terrorism, about Al Qaeda, about Taliban, all these different words. When I do that, those words come up at GCHQ, the British Intelligence Agency in Gloucestershire, um, and they mean that I'm tweeting those words more than anyone else, which makes it very suspicious. So the person, and this we only know because Edward Snowden leaked it, but the person who comes out number one of all the people in the entire world that they thought they should kill based on metadata, based on your phones, was a chap called Ahmed Zaidan, who I, I met the other day in uh, Qatar, who's an Al Jazeera journalist. Well, of course he does. He's been interviewing bin Laden, for goodness sake. So, of course, he comes out top. Does that mean he's a dreadful Al-Qaeda terrorist? No, it doesn't. But the American government, the British government, wants to use fancy computer software because that avoids putting us at risk. You know, we British or Americans don't have to go into these dangerous places and then we can just do it by computer and kill them with a the drone. End of the story. So, you know, we have these systems for getting uh, our, our intelligence. And the sad truth is that our intelligence is deeply, deeply flawed. I have a list of journalists who I know the American government wants to assassinate. And, you know, the top of that list is Bilal Abdul Karim, who is an American journalist who's today in Aleppo in Syria, and he's doing incredibly courageous war journalism. But the problem for poor old Bilal, who we talked to just last night, um, is that he goes and interviews people in al-Nusra, and the Americans think al-Nusra are the spawn of Satan and that you shouldn't talk to him. So when he interviews them to get their side of the story, just like you might interview bin Laden and you might think, wow, that's a great scoop, that immediately puts him on the American hate list because they think he's a propagandist for al-Nusra. So he's been targeted seven times. They've almost killed him. This guy has as many lives as my cat Toby, thankfully. Uh, but he's being targeted as a journalist, and he's not the only one. We're going to be bringing litigation in the none too distant future to try to protect some of these journalists who are in conflict zones who the Americans are targeting. And it's not just the Americans, the Russians are doing it. The British are involved in all of this as well. I had a journalist in Guantanamo. I love Samuel Haj, Al Jazeera journalist. Um, he was a cameraman. And I met him in Guantanamo because he needed representation. We're a charity. We represented everyone for free. And I met Sammy there, and he just didn't know what he was doing there. But I've got to say, he was, I hate to classify people as favorites, but he was one of my favorite clients of all time. Because Sammy is just an incredibly gentle, nice guy. And he's no more a terrorist than my grandmother. Um, but they'd locked him up. They originally seized Sammy. This is typical of this whole process. 
that the Americans knew that a cameraman called Sammy had interviewed bin Laden and they wanted to talk to that person to find out when, where bin Laden was so they could kill him. Um, and so they detained Samuel Hajj. Turns out Sammy was the wrong Sammy. It was a different Sammy who did that interview. So they made a, just a sort of amateurish mistake at the very beginning. Once they'd detained him, they didn't want to let him go. And at that point, the US hated Al Jazeera because they viewed Al Jazeera as a propaganda arm of Al Qaeda. And you know the reason for that is again obvious, that when bin Laden wanted to get his videos out, he wouldn't give them to the BBC or to some Russian television program. He would give them to an Arabic speaking program because they were reaching his audience. And the obvious program was Al Jazeera because they were basically the only large scale free, you know, free from government uh, coercion, basically, um, television station in the Middle East. So that the Americans put two and two together and make six and decide that Al Jazeera are evil. So therefore, Sami, who works for Al Jazeera, has to be a terrorist. So therefore, they make all these allegations against him. So he's in Guantanamo. I meet him there. And I said to Sami, you know, the Americans are mad to have you here because Anyone else is a journalist who goes to Guantanamo Bay from every other country, every other station in the world, can't talk to prisoners. The only TV station that could talk to prisoners in Guantanamo Bay was Al Jazeera, because they'd banged up Sammy, an Al Jazeera person. So I said, Sammy, what we're going to do is you're going to tell me everything you want to say on camera. I'm going to write it all down. I'm going to try and get it through the censors. I have to do it legitimately through the whole censorship program. You know, 50% of it they won't let out, the other 50% will let out, and I'm going to make you the most famous journalist in the entire world of Islam. And by doing that, what we'll do is we'll convince the Americans that it's just stupid to lock you up, and that's the way we'll get you out. Well, I told the US government that's what I was doing. This was no secret. I was just trying to represent my client. Um, and they wouldn't let him go. And so Sammy, sure enough, you know, we publicized everything about him. He was the brilliant journalist. He got me everything about Guantanamo Bay. He gave me a list of every single prisoner in Guantanamo with their names, their date of birth, their country of origin, everything about them. And it was incredibly helpful. Uh, so he stayed there for years and he had a really, really rough time of it. But finally, finally, we got him out. And actually, I saw him in Qatar the other day. I was down there and I went to see him in his home where he's now a very successful journalist and thankfully back with his wife and got four children and getting on with his life. Unfortunately, the US never says sorry and almost never compensates people. And that's true of the judicial process as it's true of Guantanamo. So for example, I've exonerated, I'm really proud, and I don't mean to be proud in that way, but it's been a wonderful thing to be able to exonerate people off death row and give them their lives back. Take Dan Bright, for example. He spent nine years on death row for a crime he clearly didn't do. The FBI knew he didn't do it. I found a document where they identified the real killer before his trial, and they just didn't bother to tell the defense or the jury that. Well, you know what's, what Dan was paid for nine years on death row and in prison? He was given $10. So that's $1.11 for each year he spent in prison. And that's crazy. Well, at least he got $10. With someone in Guantanamo Bay, you get zero. I mean, not a single prisoner who's been in Guantanamo, who we've proven to be totally innocent, has ever received any compensation. Unfortunately, the same is true of most of the people who we kill, who we don't mean to kill even, who are accidental victims of drone strikes. So we've done a report at Reprieve um, on compensation of people who are collateral damage of drone strikes where we're trying to kill one person and we kill a bunch of children. Um, and yeah, if you're American, so I'm glad to say uh, Mr. Weinstein and Mr. Laporto, two hostages who were killed in a drone strike, one was American, one Italian, they recently got paid a million dollars, their families, they're, they're, they were killed. And I'm glad for that, they deserve it, they should get that. But uh, if you're a Pakistani person who's innocent, and who's killed in a drone strike, you get zero. Interestingly, if you're an Afghan cow and you're killed in a drone strike, the farmer gets $300, but a human being in Pakistan gets nothing. And there's something deeply offensive, and it's not just the money. In fact, it's not even the money. 
the most important thing that we do, that we as Americans don't do is we can never ever bring ourselves to say those simple words I'm sorry uh, and so for example we're representing uh, Abdul Hakim Belhaj who was um, kidnapped and rendered by the British and Americans and taken to Gaddafi's Libya uh, where he and his pregnant wife were abused and he said he'd settle the lawsuit for one pound from the defendants and just the words I'm sorry and they won't do it and uh, with the other guy we sued at the same time they ended up paying him two million pounds but they refuse to say I'm sorry when they do that and that's dreadful because I find when I go to places like Yemen and I say look I'm American and I'm British I get to apologize for everything frankly um, and what we've done to your loved one in Guantanamo or what we've done to your child by killing him with the drone I'm sorry that was a dreadful dreadful mistake and it's not what we as a country are all about when you say sorry people immediately you know begin to forgive you and it immediately lowers the temperature but we're not willing to do that and that's I think a sign of immense weakness in a government that can't bring themselves to apologize one of the problems with Guantanamo was it was totally silent in the beginning and you had the American government saying these are all very bad people and no one saying anything else and you know I brought that first lawsuit back in February 2002 and our ambition me and these two other folk who were doing it was to open it up so that people would know what was happening there because we felt that if we opened it up to public inspection the world would be so horrified that they'd close it down and I think for a, a long time that was successful because if you look at it you know when we sued in 2002 oh boy did I get death threats and hate stuff you know I went on TV because I was very stupid in America and I explained why we were doing this that we Americans are better than that we're going to give people legal rights and I got accused of being a traitor 13 times in a five-minute interview and then I got all these death threats and it was really hostile back then by the time 2009 President Obama took office it had all changed and by then 65% of Americans were in favor of closing Guantanamo down and I think that was an amazing victory because we took on the most powerful man on earth George Bush the president and we beat him three times in the US Supreme Court um, so at that point Obama said I'm going to close Guantanamo great but then he didn't fight his corner and so what's happened in the last seven years is President Obama has simply not invested the, the capital he needs to. Meanwhile, the Republicans are going around saying all of the people in Guantanamo are evil. So the pendulum has swung again. And now you're looking at 65% of Americans think we should keep it open, not for any good reason, but just because no one's been fighting the other side. And it's actually quite hard to make Obama the bad guy because he's basically quite a decent person. If, on the other hand, President Trump becomes president, Guantanamo will continue, but suddenly the world will swing back in our favor again because everyone will look at Trump and say, that guy's mad. Uh, and so it'll become an issue again. But it's very hard to keep people's plight in the attention of the world because you know most people just don't care about people who are being trampled on by powerful governments. All um, governments except the most decent ones, and you can't name many, many of them, use fear and hatred to control their people in one way or another. So, you know, we as governments face difficult problems. If you look at America, we've got a dreadful crime rate. I mean, I personally have been held up at gunpoint seven times. Uh, we have a dreadful system of not having health care for poor people. We have a dreadful system where there's a lot of poor people who are below the poverty line. And, you know, you've got these massive issues in a very rich country, and you've got two choices. You can either say, all right, we're going to have sophisticated, sensible solutions to difficult problems. We're going to take away guns. We're going to do something about drugs other than just lock a few black people up. Um, you can either do that, or you can just lie to people, and you can say, ah, oh, you know, we'll have the death penalty. We'll execute a few evil black people, and somehow that's going to solve the problem. Now, that's been done for years in the world of criminal justice uh, and what we're doing now in the world of terrorism is we're terrifying people in the west about terrorism and we're using that to make a few people the bogey people who are the cause of all of our troubles 
and that's distracting people from the real issues. So take this. Imagine um, terrorism as a threat to Britain as opposed to the threat it is for the poor Syrians. Uh, in the last 10 years in Britain, it's not like we've had a thousand people a year killed by terrorists. There's been one person in the last 10 years killed in Britain by a terrorist act, just one. Now that's tragic, I'm really sorry for Mr. Rigby. It's an awful thing and it was you know, perpetrated by mad people. But at the same time, that's one person. You compare that to the number of people who die from drug overdoses or die even from car wrecks, which is like 1,730 a year. You know, there are obviously much bigger problems that face Britain than terrorism, and yet you wouldn't believe that from what the government says. The government acts like, you know, everyone in every little village is about to be attacked by ISIS every day. And what the government's doing is they've got policies that are intensely counterproductive, where they demonize Muslims, and what that does is that basically alienates a bunch of young Muslim men, so therefore pushes them towards joining extremist groups, and instead of solving the problem, we actually help create the problem. Obama says we can't have Guantanamo, we won't torture people. What does he do? He just kills them. So instead of having detention without trial, we just have execution without trial with drones and hellfire missiles. Um, and it was Rudy Giuliani, the very, very right-wing former mayor of uh, New York, who said just a couple of weeks ago, which is worse. I mean, clearly drones are worse than waterboarding. Now, unfortunately, what he meant was we should waterboard more people and torture them. But actually what he said was true, which is drones are worse than waterboarding. So what President Obama is doing is worse than what President Bush was doing. And when you look at the presidential debate and you see that the one substantive thing that Hillary Clinton said she was going to do to solve the Middle East crisis was to assassinate al-Baghdadi, I mean, that's madness. I mean, do you think that just murdering one person is somehow going to solve a massive crisis in the Middle East? It's madness. And yet it's the populist notion that um, people are peddling to their, to their electorate, and they're doing that because they don't actually have any sensible solutions to the problems. The reason there are no trials in Guantanamo Bay is because you couldn't convict people there. I mean, the people I'm representing have not committed a crime of any sort. So the vast majority of folk haven't committed a crime. There's a small group, you know, maybe 15 or 20 out of 779 who have and who have boasted about committing terrible acts. So you take someone like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He allegedly boasted that he was behind 9-11. Now, you know, you could perfectly well try him in a regular court. All you do is you pick a jury, you present, the things he said on television cameras saying that I want to kill all these Americans and you know that's the end of that. Why won't the government do that? The reason they won't do it is they've tortured him. So they know that if they give Halid Sheikh Mohammed a fair trial there's all this stuff going to come out where the whole world hears about how he was tortured. So they don't want to do that and rather than just admit that it was all dreadful and just say look we thought we should torture people, it was a dreadful mistake, we're sorry. And rather than do that and just try the guy anyhow, they spent you know, 15 years trying to cover it all up. And if there's one lesson you learn is when you try to cover things up, it just all gets worse. So they've not managed to try a single person in Guantanamo Bay because they're so intent on covering up the crimes that they themselves committed. A big mistake to think that there are people out there whose motives are to do something evil and lock up a bunch of innocent people. If that was true, it would be much easier to deal with than what I think the truth is. The truth is these people really believe the nonsense they peddle. And you know, most of these people who are saying we, uh, we should be so afraid of people in Guantanamo Bay never actually met someone there. They don't know who these human beings are. And the people who are trying to say that executing someone on death row in America is going to solve the world's problems have never met someone on death row. If they took the time to really see what's going on, they would have a different view. But the problem is, it's very hard to get them to do that. Now, I don't want to bore you to death with the thesis of my latest book, Injustice. Um, uh, you, know, you can read it if you want to go to sleep late at night, and you, it'll put you to sleep, I'm sure. But we have a lot of people just in the wrong jobs. And the people who do the intelligence 
for the United States and Britain are by definition people who have a pretty paranoid view of the world and who see a conspiracy underneath every rock. They believe it. It's not that they're making it up, but that's very, very dangerous because they're wrong a huge numbers of the time, but they believe in secrecy, so they don't want to expose what they're doing to scrutiny. So they're doing all of the secret stuff, which is just nonsense. Uh, and no one gets to see it. I get to see it, but I got a, I've got a security clearance. I get to see all this secret stuff. And they're just so wrong. And I, I, I've offered to them, I say, look, I'd love to just sit down with you and let's talk about these people that you think are so bad. And I'll tell you my side, you tell me your side, and let's come to some sort of conclusion. They won't do it. There are very few people who are so sociopathic that they say to themselves, I'm going to try to take an innocent person and torture them into saying something false. You know, there may be one or two sociopaths out there who do that, but not most people. Most people who do it honestly, honestly believe that we need to stop another 9-11 attack on America and we've got to get this information. And when they torture people, they get something and they believe it. And I'll tell you the best example of that, and it's just madness. You may remember that in 2003, 2004, there was a big scandal in America where the Americans thought they'd solved a nuclear bomb plot where some terrorists were going to blow a nuclear bomb up in New York City. And John Ashcroft, then Attorney General, uh, went on television, he was in Moscow at the time, and he took a break from his Moscow trip and said, we have just arrested two people, um, Binyam Mohammed and another person, and they were going to have a dirty bomb, a nuclear bomb that they were going to blow up in New York City. Well, you know, you can imagine that's pretty terrifying to the American people. I represented Binyam Mohammed. I met him in Guantanamo, and we gradually began to try to understand what happened. And what happened was an inexorable process. So when he was first detained in Pakistan, the Americans asked him what they asked everyone, which is, what do you know about nuclear weapons? Because that's what everyone was paranoid about. Totally predictable, they would ask those questions. Binyam was from Britain and he knew he had legal rights, or he thought he did. So he said, I'm not talking to you. I'll talk to the Brits because that's my country, but I'm not talking to you. That inevitably made them think he was covering something up. So that's when they started torturing him. Now, after a bit of torture, Binyam was obstinate, so he, he you know, wouldn't talk. But after a bit of torture, he said, all right, what do you need to know? And they said, what do you know about nuclear weapons? He said, well, I did read on the internet how to build a nuclear bomb. So they go, oh, wow. And so they ask him, what do you do? And he said, you take uranium, you put it in a bucket, and you swing the bucket around your head. That's called a centrifuge. That divides the uranium up, and you get weapons-grade uranium, and that's what you use for a nuclear bomb. Well, you know, you don't have to be a scientist to know that that's a fantasy. Um, what had happened in reality is he had seen this thing, which was a spoof on the Internet, and I traced that back to a woman in Florida who had written this spoof in the 1970s. And she was aghast that that was the basis for the nuclear, nuclear bomb plot. But what happened then is there were a bunch of Americans who went totally stupid who said, that's just ridiculous. But there were others who said, oh my God, maybe it's true. We cannot run the risk that this was a nuclear bomb plot. So they reported back to Washington. This game of whispers happens. Washington says, oh my goodness, this is dreadful. They then send him to Morocco, where they tortured him for 18 months. Every two weeks, they took a razor blade to his genitals, by which time he'd obviously say whatever they wanted to hear. And at that point, they had their nuclear bomb plot, and it was total, unadulterated bullshit. And yet this was what they said to the American people, because they believed it. And as a consequence, they terrified everybody, and Binyam Mohammed ended up in Guantanamo Bay. And it was only when we exposed what had happened to him that he was set free and he's now married and living quietly and happily in Britain. So, you know, this is the sort of thing that happens all the time, unfortunately. Uh, and it causes immense harm to the individuals who are victims of torture. But it also causes immense harm to the people of the world because they're terrified by things that are just nonsense. You can't generalize about everyone in Guantanamo um, because people have suffered through different tortures and they're different people. But I'll say, when I first interviewed Bin, Binyam Mohammed, who had been taken for 18 months of torture, first in Morocco and then in the dark prison in uh, Afghanistan, I sat with him for three days while he told me what had happened to him. 
it never occurred to me when I was a bit younger that I, as an American citizen, would be sitting talking to someone about how my government had tortured him in such unbelievably medieval ways. Uh, and I've got to say, after three days, I felt like I had post-traumatic stress disorder, but it was obviously nothing compared to Binyam. And one thing he said really struck me. He said, Clive, um, you know, I'm kind of dead in the head at this point, and I can't tell you any of the emotional stuff, so you're just going to have to imagine what the emotions are. But for most of the people I represent who we get out of Guantanamo, there is no help. You know, if you go to Algeria or if you go to various places, you know, Kazakhstan, for goodness sake, you're not going to get post-traumatic treatment to try to get over what you've been through, and that's really tough. And we have a project at Reprieve called Life After Guantanamo where we try to help people get that sort of help. But if America had any sense at all, they would be funding it because it's obviously in everyone's interest to take people who have been really scarred by what we've done and help them um, get better. If America had a whole system of secret prisons and they were designed for one purpose only and that was to keep prisoners away from lawyers and the media so that they could be mistreated in a way to get intelligence. And the purpose was not just to torture people, the purpose was to get intelligence. But it was a mad purpose because we lost perspective, a perspective that has built up over the last thousand years that torture is not just barbaric, it's counterproductive because you don't get good intelligence. So the US had a series of places and Guantanamo tells you the secret behind them. The idea of Guantanamo was to have a prison in a place that wasn't American soil, where the prisoners had no legal rights, where the US could do whatever they wanted to them. And when you see that pattern, it immediately teaches you what they do to other, uh, other prisons. So we had ships that we held people on, on the principle that that was miles away from anywhere. The problem with ships is naval ships are US territories, so they actually qualify as having legal rights. So we use secret prisons in various Eastern European countries like um, Lithuania, Romania, uh, and Poland because we, the US, bullied those countries into al allowing us to have secret prisons there where prisoners were held for ages and, and tortured. There were prisons used in our proxy states like Morocco, Jordan, Syria even, and Egypt where we sent prisoners to be mistreated by the locals, but we, the Americans, were the ones who were sending the questions. So there was this whole network of torture prisons that the US was behind because they thought that was the solution to getting intelligence. And you know, what they did then is they just didn't read or forgot the, lesson, the lessons of a thousand years of history, which is that that's barbaric and it doesn't get you the intelligence you want, it gets you bad intelligence. The very best example is Ibn Sheikh al-Libi. Ibn Sheikh al-Libi, the US thought, was number three in Al-Qaeda. He was talking to them but not saying what they wanted to hear, so they took him to Egypt where the Egyptians tortured him with electric cattle prods. He then said, yes, I'm a member of Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda was working with Saddam Hussein on weapons of mass destruction. That was then quoted by George Bush in October 2002 as a reason to go for war. It was quoted by Colin Powell in the UN as a reason to go to war. We went to war, thousands of people died, and there were no weapons of mass destruction. So what you see there is the quintessential example of torturing someone into a giving intelligence that's just totally bogus, but that leads to catastrophic consequences. And you look at the Middle East today, and the Middle East today is in the chaos it's in, in large part because of the invasion of Iraq, which was predicated on torture evidence. So if ever there was a lesson why you shouldn't do it, that's the best one. The ones that are much more difficult to deal with are cases like Chris Maharaj. Chris is a British guy who was sentenced to death in 1986 for a crime he clearly didn't do. Now I got him off death row, that wasn't so difficult. But he's 78 today and he's still in prison and his 77-year-old wife Marita has stuck by him for 30 years. I know he didn't do it because I've met the people who did. I went to Medellin in Colombia and I got four people who were closely associated with the cartels to admit that they did the murders. Uh, and yet Chris is still in prison. 
Now, those are the cases we really need to focus on, is how it is that our system can be so morally bankrupt that we're unwilling to accept that we've got someone like that who spent 30 years in prison, that we got the wrong person.